All right, we're live. All right, welcome to the Evan Grove Charter School School Board meeting Tuesday, March 16th. We're going to call our meeting to order. We do have a quorum. Uh, if everyone will begin and recite the Pledge of Allegiance alongside with me, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, we did have an executive session to discuss a legal matter, um, and we're going to continue on the mission statement, if everyone will repeat after me, to inspire passion for lifelong learning, one, one student, student at, at a time. time. Sarah, Miss Sarah, would you do our roll call, please? Yes. Uh, Dwayne Degler. Here. Eugene Steiger. No. Stacey Barno. Here. Robert Rainier. Here. Colleen Preston. Here. Deji Akintoy. Here. Brian Ladman. Here. Kristen Smith. Here. And Michelle McCray. Here. Excellent. Thank you very much. All right. We're going to move along. The board working session of uh, February 16th. Uh, I hope everyone got to review it. Check it out. Uh, if there's any questions or changes that we need to make. If not, do we have a motion to approve the February 16th board working session meeting minutes? I'll motion, Michelle McCray. Thank you, Michelle. Second? I'll second. So. Thank you. All in favor, just give me a big nod. All in favor, thank you so much. Um, moving along, the, uh, the public board minutes of February 16th, the same evening. Uh, if you have any questions or concerns, revisions, no. Uh, do I have a motion to approve the board meeting minutes of February? I'll motion again, Michelle McCray. Perfect. Do I have a second? I'll second. I'll second. <laughs> <laughs> Colleen, you beat me. All right, okay. Colleen, all, all in favor, nod your head. Perfect. All in favor. Thank you very much. Um, and then on February 24th, uh, uh, sorry, February 12th, we had a, sp a special public board meeting. Um, and did you, if you review those minutes, do I have a motion to approve those meeting minutes? Dwayne, I'll make a motion to approve Stacy Barno. Thank you, Stacy. Have a second. I'll second. Kristen Smith, thank you all in favor. Big nod. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you all in favor. Thank you very much. Moving right along, Mr. Bruto, uh, student enrollment, how we doing? So uh, enrollment for the period ending uh, February 28th, uh, our enrollment was at 1863. During the month of February, we had four students withdraw and three new enrollments. Um, our wait list for the current 2021 school year was still sitting at 240 students. Um, and we had at the end of February, 379 applications for the 21-22 school year. Um, we did run the kindergarten lottery and made our first round of kindergarten offers um, on Monday, February or Monday, March 1st. And then this past or yesterday, uh, Monday, March 15th, we ran the lottery for grades first through 12th for next year and started our first round of seat offerings um, in those grade levels. So uh, admissions is open and, and running for next school year at this point. Excellent. That's good to hear. Great news. Uh, moving along, uh, student representative report and Mr. Gassler's with us. Decided to join us this time. Carter, how are you? Yes, I'm back. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, no other conflicts tonight. Um, no, sorry, I missed good. last meeting, but I hope, I hope Gillen all did good. well enough. <laughs> Carter, are you sharing a screen? I'm going to have to stop this anyway. I'm, I'm, I am, right? Uh, yes, I was just about to share one. All right, there I go. Out. All right, can everyone see that? Yep. All right, so this is our March student activity report. Uh, we've had a busier month, so that's been exciting. Uh, oops. Went too far. All right, so Student Council is hosting March Madness events on Instagram. Um, so they are posting essentially brackets on their stories and we're having students vote on like the best movies, the best songs um, throughout the month of March. 
And we're also ha- holding a competition for which teachers should wear a leprechaun costume on St. Patrick's Day. Uh, I believe Mr. McGeehan and Mr. Parente were the winners of that. So look out for pictures of them, or sorry, uh, Mr. McGeehan and Mr. Maitland um, were the winners of that. So be sure to look out for pictures um, of them tomorrow on St. Patrick's Day. Um, so that'll be pretty fun and exciting. Uh, National Honor Society is hosting a big donation drive throughout the month of March. Uh, They're raising um, basic supplies for youth centers, uh, food pantries, and animal shelters like La Mancha. Um, And they're continuing to provide their peer tutoring service. Um, From what I've heard, that's been very successful um, and it's helping out a lot of people. So good for them. Uh, High School Yearbook is now collecting senior quotes. Uh, They're collecting teacher senior photos. So um, teachers, you can have your own senior photo featured in this year's yearbook. Uh, They're collecting pet photos. So if you have uh, pictures of your favorite pets that you spent quarantine with, you can share those. Um, And then photos of teachers and their masks to be featured in this year's book because that's um, just been a huge part of the year. Uh, So Triumph, they are planning a virtual name that tune competition. Um, So that should be a fun event, uh, fun classic for them. Uh, So we're excited that they're able to get that in this year. Uh, So the academic competition team has just wrapped up their season. Uh, So Varsity finished the season with a victory over Renaissance Academy um, in the round of 32, uh, but then unfortunately lost to Conestoga in the round of 16. Um, Conestoga, of course, is a very formidable opponent um, that went on to do pretty well this year. Uh, JV had a similar story. They won over Octorera in the round of 16, um, but they lost to Henderson. Uh, in the next round. So um, also lost a very solid team. So uh, we're quite happy with how the season went and we'll continue to practice in the off season and hope that the competition uh, returns to its normal format next year. Uh, So DECA, we have some exciting news. Two members qualified for the International Career Development Conference that will be held at the end of April. Um, So that's essentially an international DECA competition. Um, So students from around the world, um, so all throughout the US, Mexico, Um, Germany, Spain. Um, Normally we'd all come together uh, in Anaheim, California, but of course it's virtual this year um, for a DECA competition. So that's exciting. Carter, Um, who's the two students? uh, It is me and Kate Engelman, who is a sophomore. Yeah, congratulations. Thank you. (laughs) Um, And then we've also elected next year's executive board who will also be attending the virtual conference um, to attend leadership seminars. Uh, to learn how to continue to expand our club. So right now we have about um, 8% of the total high school uh, enrolled in DECA, and we want to see that number continue to grow. Um, Does anyone have any questions about what's been going on over the past month? No, board members, no. Excellent job, Carter, as always. Fantastic looking slides, great job. And congratulations on that other thing, perfect. If nothing else, thank you again. Big round of applause for Carter. And we're going to just move along. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Mr. Bruto, any public comments? There were no public comments submitted for tonight's meeting. Okay, moving along. Uh, Board committees. um, uh, I'll pass myself. Uh, Mr. Rainier. I'll I'll give the opportunity. Based on the finance department. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, facilities, Brian. All right. Good evening, get everybody. Uh, so we met um, last Monday, and we started out talking about uh, preparing to bring more students back into the school. So that was exciting. Um, we covered some old business dealing with staffing. There are eight applications that have been submitted uh, for the open positions uh, dealing with grounds building. We had one application submitted for the HVAC position, so hopefully those get filled soon. I think there was some activity late last week, um, so we'll get some updates in the future meetings. Custodial operations update. Deep cleaning was going well, uh, so that was good to hear. Um, Covering facilities, operations, and projects. We discussed the storm water management uh, project plan, and so There'll be a walkthrough for that scheduled shortly. Uh, We discussed the DEP air monitoring lease. And so um, the draft, I think, is still in legal review and will require board approval. Uh, Basically, uh, there will be a site visit by 
um, a representative to, to collect the data. Um, they will come on site as needed and notify us and have an escort at the same time. It'll be a one year agreement. Uh, we will receive $150 per month to buffer any electrical costs associated with the monitoring equipment. We discussed the ballistic window film project, which uh, funding was received through a, a grant award. So that was cool. Uh, goal for installation is going to be during spring break on the first level, primary windows and egress, ingress doors. Uh, we discussed the cafeteria Univent and the CO2 monitoring projects, which uh, we're still working on trying to get those under the building automation system. So that's uh, still in works. Over at the ELC campus, we discussed the carrier ventilation unit upgrades. And so the facilities team there is still working on the repairs and the upgrades were, were in the process of getting quotes uh, from carrier for the uh, various upgrade packages that would be required. We spent some time on the school-wide facilities plan. Uh, so currently the facilities team is collecting data and Ian Curry uh, reported that they were making good progress there. So that was good to hear. Uh, there were discussions pertaining to the turf and landscape management plans as well as snow operations. Uh, so we're going to be looking for some new vendors um, for the landscape once our current contract is up. Um, Capital improvement projects for the summer of 2021. Um, we had the projects go out for bid. And so there were five bids that were received for general trades, three for plumbing, three for the mechanical uh, services, and unfortunately zero for electrical services. I was told that that is not uncommon. And so as a newbie, I had no choice but to believe everybody. And so no one was overly concerned, which was good. Um, so we're currently uh, circling back to look at uh, how to obtain a, an electrical contractor that time. And so we'll have an update for that next weekend. Lowest bids for mechanical contractor was the Clipper Pipe and Service Inc. Uh, the plumbing contract was Stan Roche Plumbing. General Trades BSS contractors. So it was my understanding at that time that those three likely get those contracts uh, with the electrical still outstanding. Um, facilities Department at State Road talked about window replacement phase two um, in the 1955 building, fourth and fifth grade classrooms. So we're still waiting to get back uh, a quote from Superior Glass. We were told the project roughly take eight weeks. Um, to install those windows, discussed a little bit of the arts wing renovation. And so my understanding was uh, Mrs. Bishop was gonna meet with the contractor uh, who drew up the plans and we're getting recommendations for the next round of drawings. Uh, new business at the State Road campus, we got uh, discussed bathroom renovations. And so uh, the contractor is supposed to follow up, follow up with floor tile repairs and punch list there. And that's supposed to be done during spring break. Um, we covered uh, problems with the water supply return and the hot water challenges in the boys and girls, uh, the staff and the boys gang restrooms near the bistro. The hope is that those were going to be operational by 3-8. And so I assume that was taken care of. Um, so that was good. Finally, uh, we talked about tra campus transition planning and returning furniture for uh, use in all of the campus um, classrooms. And so since we're practically there, I assume it was scheduled for 310 and 317. So most of that should be completed or scheduled soon to be completed. Um, so really that was, uh, it was quite a busy meeting and that's uh, about all I have. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, moving right along, unless there's any questions. Nope. Kristen Smith, uh, HR committee. Stacy's actually gonna do the report for this month. Okay, thank you very much, Stacy. Thanks, Kristen. So we, HR and myself in Quest met on March 1st. Um, the big topic of discussion specifically was the plan um, to transition to um, more full-time learning. So um, some of the discussions were um, based upon feedback from the teachers in Quest. Um, we talked about the 360 degree feedback process, which um, was completed. It began on February 22nd um, and it closed out on March the 6th. Um, and we have our next meeting scheduled for Monday, April the 4th. 
that's it. Excellent. Uh, well, we're going to stay with you for strategic planning. Uh, strategic planning is actually scheduled to meet next week. Um, so they will be meeting for the month of March on Tuesday, um, March the 23rd at 7.30 p.m. And I gave my report for February in the month of February. So that's all, Dwayne. Great. Thank you very much. Okay, back to head of school uh, for the health and safety plan update. Kristen, you're muted. Okay, sorry. That's okay. All right. So, okay, we are going back to school. Obviously, that's been part of the conversation and all the communication that we've been sharing. So the county transmission rate for the three weeks, it was incidence rates were for week one, February 26th was 95.24. Um, then it went from that to 86.10 the week of March 5th. And then on March 12th, 70.6 with a positivity rate that fluctuated down as you can see. So we hit the three weeks, which means we are planning to go back to school and we start Monday. So Kemblesville's furniture is in. It was a lengthy process. Um, we moved some desks around and tables around, and then we're doing State Road tomorrow. So a big shout out to facilities who's been working on that along with Mrs. O'Connor and the principals. Um, I was here at Kemblesville, and it was an all-day process. So it is not an easy thing. The teachers are rearranging rooms and trying to put themselves back together. So a lot of work that's going into that, but we're very excited that the kids are coming back and we're hitting these targets and able to get the classrooms ready. So just a quick reminder, this has been said multiple times, but it's something that I need to say again, just so that we're all on the same page. A close contact is identified as more than 15 minutes, less than six feet. Transient interactions of less than three feet are gonna happen for less than 15 minutes, such as passing out papers, they're unavoidable, but we are looking for that 15 minutes. So now that kids are sitting three feet apart, there might be kids that have to quarantine if there's a positive case. With that being said, the school AGCS will not shut down if there is countywide transmission increase or if there's something that's happening in a school. It's just if there's link transmission, if they are in that three feet with a positive person for more than 15 minutes, that is how we will decide who it gets to quarantine and not, and it will go through the Chester County Health Department. Hallway transitions, they'll use the e-hall pass, so we'll know who's in the hallway. We have seating charts in all the classrooms, lunchroom, everything. So I just wanted to make sure those are frequently asked questions that I wanted to address with the board and with the public. So some of the things that were changed in the health and safety plan is updated language regarding the three feet, obviously the physical distancing requirements, stress use of privacy shields. We, um, uh, we are asking teachers to use the privacy shields, especially during snack and lunch. However, there will be times that's an extra layer of mitigation. And we have told the teachers, if they're doing an activity where kids can't see the board and they need to put the privacy shield down, it's not mandatory, but when they're eating or drinking and masks are off for any given time, those privacy shields have to be up. Um, reiterating that school's antigen testing program is implemented in the new health and safety plan and it's really come in handy. Um, updating exclusion from school stipulations and removing the travel restriction language and update, updating the quarantine that the, if obviously the vaccinated individuals that have been vaccinated for more than two weeks will not have to quarantine if they have a positive, if they have a exposure. Um, however, if they're feeling symptoms or any of that, then they would have to quarantine and, and go through the proper protocol. Brian, is there anything else you wanna to add to that? No, uh, just that at the end of the report, there'll be the need for a motion to approve the updated health and safety plan. Yep. Does the board have any questions? No. Sorry. Keep going. All right. So there has been uh, the phase one is happening right now for the vaccinations. This is a really exciting thing. And the teachers, I have to give them a, a big shout out. They this it went very well, but they are feeling symptoms. So some of them had said, you know, it's it knocked them right off their feet. So they had to they felt sick. Um, but they are recovering and getting to school. And we are, 
you know, following following the required sub coverage. But I will tell you, they're they're strong and they're and they're coming in even feeling that aftermath of the vaccination. So we out of the staff right now, we have 122 employees that at least has one shot in the arm if they didn't get the Johnson and Johnson. But that is a huge increase from the last time. And then there's nine contractors so far that have had the, the vaccination. So we're looking at phase two. I just sent the email out today that said, if you didn't register and want to get it, this is your last opportunity through the IU. So they're now registering for um, a second time if they didn't get the vaccination, but they've had plenty of opportunity to get a vaccination if they want a vaccination. So, and phase one, again, included special education staff, ELL, bus drivers, teachers and staff in K to six, and we've even moved on to the seven through 12 staff, and a lot of them have received the vaccination. So we are really happy about where that is. Is there any questions about teachers and vaccinations? Michelle McCray. Just a quick question. The 122 employees, does that include all the staff under phase one at the IU or are there still some this week that would add to that number? There's still some that will add to that number this week um, because it is, it's up till the 20th and some still have appointments. So that will still, that's increasing every day. And even the people that already had it, some of them haven't all got, this is HR's number of who's reported. I don't, I don't know who actually shows up and registers. So it's really up to them to contact HR and they're trickling in. So that, but that 122 is just our employees, not the IU. It's a total of our employees. So I anticipate that going up. There are some too that are, that have gotten their first dose of either the Pfizer or Moderna and are still waiting that did not go in the Johnson and Johnson group. Yeah. I have one more question too. Um, the two week quarantine um, or not, uh, not be having the quarantine two weeks after the vaccination, is that two weeks after the Johnson and Johnson one dose and that's two weeks after Pfizer or Moderna second dose, is that correct? Second dose, yes. yep, second dose for, the, for the, the two and then the Johnson and Johnson after they get the one, it's two weeks after that. Okay. And then that would be yeah. up to three months. And a lot of the teachers are asking me why three months? And what I told them is right now, when you get COVID, you have that immune to immunity for that, that 90 days. What's going to happen is these first round of vaccinations just happened in December. So they're just approaching now that three month stand. We don't have any data on what happens after that three months. So they're keeping that data right now. And I'm not sure if, if they find that we'll need a booster after three months, but We'll find out from all the doctors, nurses that got that in December by the time they're now coming out of that at that time frame. Great. Thank you. So, Kristen, we had I think we had originally allocated 89 doses. Is that correct? Or some number like that? 84. Yeah. Did they, well, did they use them all? Um, there's a few still uh, that are going to the 20th. So not all of that 122 is the 84. A lot of staff got vaccinations outside of the Johnson and Johnson. I was really okay. surprised at that number. Okay, great. I just, I just don't want them to go. We got them. It'd be great to use them. I, I did get an email actually, when we were at our working session that said we were opening up for extra that they're moving on to the waiting list. So I have to get that email out. So just as we're speaking a lot of more opportunity. So excited about that. Awesome. So again, the timeline um, we have K to six returning Monday for that four day week with still keeping the Wednesday. Then that following week, March 29th, seven through 12 will come followed by a short week for spring break first through the fifth on April. Obviously Monday, the fifth is a um, professional development day. April 6th through the 9th, we'll finish out the week with that continue with that Wednesday for all K to 12 students. And then April 12th, full transition, five day a week for those students that want to come back full week. Any more questions or concerns about the schedule? Okay. I'll let Brian go over the data. Go ahead, Brian. So um, in the presentation tonight, I included some of the um, data that uh, I pulled together from the transitions that we've been making so that the board and the public can kind of see the, the, the scale at which we're seeing 
transitions happen and, and the work that has gone into having to, to prep for this transition to occur, given the uh, guidelines that, that we have to cover. So on this one, you'll see that this is just a change to no change of uh, learning intention cohorts. Like, um, so we had, when everything is said and done, about uh, 62 and a half percent of our school change their cohort that's red going to uh, virtual students coming hybrid virtual students going to four day a week model hybrid students moving to a four day a week model and every other scenario um, we had you know to 62 and a half percent of our student body changing somehow um, and I gave the grade level breakdown so that you can see that the majority, the, the, the highest percentage of change really happened down in, in our early primary grade levels. Um, and, and you had the most, the most student movement between cohorts. You can go to the next slide. Um, this, this slide shows the movement of students from what their co current cohort is, which is the rows, and what their transition cohort is, which is your columns. So, um, so you kind of read it on uh, across and then in diagonals. So you can see that there, 39 blue cohort students stayed blue. 483 blue cohort students moved to green. So that's two day a week hybrid to four or five day a week. And one blue, uh, blue student went virtual for the remainder of the year. Of our current gold students, so the next row down, 70 of them stayed gold, 454 of them transitioned to four or the four or five day a week cohort and one went virtual. Um, of our current green students, 261, they all pretty much stayed where they were at. Um, one scaled back to hybrid and one moved to virtual. Uh, and of our virtual learners, 33 uh, moved into the blue two day a week hybrid group. 43 moved into the gold two day a week hybrid group, 139 transitioned from virtual learning to the four and five day a week group of green and 328 stayed um, remote. So you, you see some pretty big swings there. And, um, you know, previously when we had, you know, uh, uh, over 500, almost 600 kids um, virtual learners were, were down to about 330 remaining for the rest of the, of the school year uh, with the, with the uh, largest group transitioning back to that more normal uh, school schedule. There's a couple things I want to point out. One is that parents really were appreciative of the choice. And number two, I know that there was some confusion around the initial survey. And in the initial survey, we were asking for feed, we wanted them to give us what cohort they wanted to be in. However, we told them that it was for planning purposes because it was being that if they picked hybrid and we didn't have enough kids to support that, that we were gonna move them into that five day a week. So we wanted the flexibility. But in doing that, parents were confused and thought that they picked a cohort for planning purposes only and wanted to change it within that two week span. We allowed them to do that. And it did change some of our numbers, which changed our furniture. But most importantly, what I was hearing is the YMCA and the programs, the child care programs were closing because teach districts were all going back to school, which then forced parents to make different decisions. So I think we gave parents a lot of flexibility and a lot of time to make the choice that worked for their kids. And uh, I just wanted to point that out as part of the conversation because I know it was a hot topic. Um, within forums. So I wanted to make sure I addressed it. You go to the next slide. Uh, and this is your breakdown by grade level. Um, the, the first group of colored columns are your actual student end counts by grade level. Um, and then the second group on the far right is your percentage of the grade level by cohort so that you can see um, what, how many kids by grade level are in what, what cohort and what learning model and then also the percentage of it. Uh, you can see, again, it kind of, you know, the, the percentage of students who are coming in, returning back for a, a more full-time learning model um, starts highest in kindergarten, in kindergarten and first, 
and then kind of decreases a little bit um, as the grade levels go up. Uh, and conversely, remote learning, you know, you see a, a, a inverse to our virtual students um, at the same time. So just if the board was was curious about what, what you're seeing in the number of students by grade level who are making these transitions, and these are these are high numbers, and there's a lot of, been a lot of work um, on behalf of the administration and the principals and our teachers and, and office staff of trying to make um, the, the puzzle pieces fit, the numbers work, and, and the logistics work to, to make this happen for um, our students in a time where across the Commonwealth, there are still a lot of schools who are not able to uh, get over the logistical hurdles that, that come with trying to make this type of transition within the constraints that we have to operate under. So just some of the uh, transition things that we've been working on, obviously furniture is a big hot topic and set up and seating charts and all of the things that go along with that, the facilities, the cleaning and sanitizing, obviously we're going with more children and we're going to have to step up the amount of um, cleaning and sanitizing that's happening on a regular basis. And then just the grade level needs. So part of the conversation, every grade level needs something different. So you just saw the numbers in kindergarten. There were 19 kids virtual and just in, in, in kindergarten alone that are staying virtual, along with some blue and gold kids in that mix, which is over 20. Teachers on that Wednesday were really spending the time meeting with those small groups of virtual kids. So the early elementary school teachers are saying, if I have 20 kids in the class, they still need to be in my class for group instruction, for things that we're doing as a class. But I don't know how I'm going to find the time to give them that small group instruction and the things that they need when I have those 20 kids in the classroom. So what we did is we were bringing in a sub per grade level for the early elementary school levels. And those extra teachers will be assigned a grade level to work with those small groups in those virtual kids. They're not getting a different teacher. I'm making that very clear. They're getting in a layer of support so that those virtual kids can meet in small groups and get that intention that they got on that Wednesday, which is really important. And they'll support the teacher in a very strict schedule so that you know they can support those kids while there's a transition. I do need to say, you know, when kids and I and it's not that the virtual kids are not going to get the attention that they've gotten. It's that they have parents need to understand that there's a transition as kids are coming in. They're learning new processes and procedures, and there needs to be an understanding of at least that week transition, just like when we're starting a bus schedule for the first time and we say it's going to work out some kinks. There's going to have that as we as we transition this through this. And we so, did do that at the beginning of the year too, if you'll remember, we yep. we went we had virtual learners go asynchronous while we taught our in-person students the procedures that they needed to follow. Exactly. We have to do it again. Right. So with that being said, um, with the other grade levels, we got a lot of feedback. Hey, I have only two virtual kids. We're fine. We don't need that support. And to get another person in the mix is too hard and difficult for us. So the principals are really working with each grade level on what they need to make this transition work to be able to give the options that we're giving parents through this transition. So uh, we, we might revisit some of these options that might work and might not. That's the beauty of being flexible through this is that if it's not working, we will change it so that it works what's in the best interest for kids. So um, we're hoping that this is going to work because we've seen each of these plans transition and we worked out the problem solving, but not with no big major changes. So we, I'm anticipating the same thing as we, as we get through that. So there is some conversation around kids right now, and, and we are seeing the same things that all the school districts are seeing, which is there is a lot of need for mental health attention and kids that are struggling academically, um, even high school students, even seniors that are just trying to graduate. And so with that being said, there are so many interventions that are taking place. So I'm gonna have Ryan talk about the slide and where she is with working with the administrative team on um, giving some of those kids that support. Sure, so um, as our foundational layer, we have, um, had a lot of focus this year on relationship building and building that into 
um, the classroom for K to six, it, it's occurring daily. And then for seven through 12, it's occurring at least at a minimum of twice a week. We've been really focusing on our school-wide PBIS efforts. Uh, and then these go in, in, in order of intensity. So we have social um, and academic intervention groups. So those are our small groups. So we have structured study hall. Um, we have students come in on Wednesdays to receive academic support. Uh, we have individual tutoring supports. Then we have our check-in, check-out program where students check in and out at the beginning and end of each day. And then um, with the teacher in each individual class period, one-on-one -on -one mental health counseling and supports. Um, and then the virtual attendance support program is new this year. Um, that is one that we've partnered with the IU to do assessment barriers to see um, the difficulties that students are having with their attendance and, and engagement in their learning. And then the highest layer of support would be the ATTEND program, which we're also partnering with the IU to do functional behavior assessments, look at um, an added layer of potential um, supports in home or in school, depending on the individual need. And then with the thought of students returning five days, we know that we will um, need to revisit a lot of the PBIS and uh, direct instruction on procedures and routines, but we also are looking at adding a school social worker K through 12 to help us with our highly disengaged students and help families get supports from the community. And then Can I just touch upon that real quick, Ryan. Sure. So that's not going to be an additional position. We've yeah. never, we never filled the upper school behavior position. I, I, it was student services is what it was called. So it's not an additional position. We're just repurposing that position as a social worker so that we can help these families tie into the community. So we're not going to need board approval for that, but we wanted you to understand that if you saw the posting um, that you understood where it was coming from and how we were funding it. Yeah. So after speaking with the counselors, um, we see a lot of need for a liaison between families and the community to get um, parents hooked up with different uh, community-based resources. So that is the rationale for that one. And then we are looking at expanding our social emotional or our social and academic intervention groups to include um, some type of after-school option for our high school, knowing that Wednesdays are um, going to be not going to be an option anymore. So we need to shift to something that would be after school to support those students. That Wednesday program is amazing. I mean, there are some kids and I know that there's been some talk about that grading system, but there are, if, if kids turn in their work, that's the difference between failing and passing at this point. And so allowing kids to come in on that Wednesday that are failing to work with tutors to get that work done and get the support has made the difference of kids, multiple kids passing and failing. And so to rip that service away from them is going to be detrimental to their success. And so giving them that after school option is really important. And at this point, you know, even with the support we're giving them in the summer with the summer program for the early elementary school kids, it's really important to remember that our priority with the Essers money right now is to give kids this service to support them academically because they really, there are a group that are really struggling and, and, and it's evident in all of our, in all of our data. And I really have to shout out Tara Delgado for that one who is calling every single family every week because it's a rolling basis. It's not an open invitation. We get lists and names from the teachers each week. Then Tara makes phone calls to all the families, organizes all their work, um, make sure that we have the staffing for it. So there's a ton of work that goes into it. And I really do have to um, give credit where it's due for Tara on that one. Agreed. Any questions about that? Okay. Thanks, Ryan. Yep. Um, so we are transitioning to spring sports. We did not um, have winter sports. They uh, did have some senior celebrations for those seniors that didn't have their winter sports, but with the weather changing and us moving five days, we would like to get into the spring sports, they're, they're starting tryouts um, and they are looking at, you know, training agreement forms and athletic daily screening forms, working with Nurse Holly to make sure that they're following the athletic health and safety plans that were um, put in place in the fall that we followed in the fall. Some of the changes from the fall are the following. 
Um, they would like to increase group drills to 15 athletes or less. You had in the fall 10. They would also like to change that um, they're required to wear a mask at three feet like they are in school. Um, and then as far as spectators, they would like to have in the fall, we had just seniors that had spectators. We'd like to have two spectators for every for the high school students that are participating at home events only and no outside visitors from other teams. And then as far as um, obviously all the required in-person social distancing is going to be required for all the teams that are coming in um, for, for outdoor sports in the spring. So the athletic health and safety plan is attached here and will be uploaded in board docs. It, it, it follows the requirement that I'm saying right now, as far as the changes, um, then they'll be in red in the presentation. Is there any concerns about any of that as we update that athletic health and safety plan? Go ahead, Michelle. I'm just curious, how are the spectators, how are those rules enforced? So the athletic director and Dr. Maitland are taking the responsibility for enforcing two tickets, making sure that somebody's there checking in on which student they're representing, and then that the social distancing on the side of the fields are, are being you know implemented. Great, thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? And these are all outdoor outdoor sports. Okay. Kristen, does that cover your section there? Because we'll go back and we'll yeah, we'll go more. back and we'll we'll cover all health and safety updates. Okay. Um, and then I just wanted to kind of talk about the community events that are happening. It's one thing to transition us into a for learning and academics. But I think that the administrative team, along with the, the principals and the teachers, are doing such an amazing job trying to continue to enforce the community events that we would have in a very um, socially distant and virtual way. And so the father-daughter dance was and, and the mother-son, which they'll be doing something for them too, is at, or loved one. It's not just fathers, it's loved ones too that go with their with their students. It's a tradition that is really uh, an amazing one. And they put together the most sweet, the sweetest event. Um, kids were dancing with their dads or loved ones and making crafts and painting and decorating donuts. And I think it really speaks to who we are as a school, that we're still that small knit community that is allowing kids to still have these experiences, even though they're dealing with the pandemic. And I know some of you on the board, even I heard went, I think Mr. Ladman, you went, Brian, um, I don't know, I'm assuming you had a great time, but I, I just wanted to make sure that, I don't know if any other dads are out there that went on the board, but I, I know Brian did. If there's anybody else that wanna speak on that behalf, I really do think it's amazing what they're putting in place. Another thing that I, I saw was we have preschool visits and visits for kindergarten and every Saturday teachers are taking turns working with preschool students on Zoom to experience what Campbellsville is all about and make things and explore their, the building. They come in on a Saturday. Again, those extra things that really speak to who we are. Uh, prom is happening. Uh, we are going to COVID test the kids. We have a very small group of kids that are participating right now. We'll follow the health and safety guidelines, but we are putting a plan in place for prom. And high school graduation happened last year um, and will happen again this year with all the safety protocols. We are going to do the same outside graduation um, that we had last year. And so it was, it was a beautiful graduation, but we're, we're, and we're going to go to all the seniors houses. So the same traditions will still happen with safety in mind. So I just wanted to kind of really give a shout out and make sure the board is aware that these things are happening at the school. Any questions? Okay. Um, I know I've talked about this at the board meeting, but we was in the daily local. And again, it speaks to who we are as a school fundraising. And I'm not sure if you're seeing the, the publicity around the kindness that's still continuing through this fundraiser. Um, but, you know, just even have the firefighters on their social media sites posting the things that they're getting from kids with the police officers and Ronald McDonald House and all of those things. 
I just, I, it continues to really just speak to amazing things that are happening at the school. Ryan, is there anything you want to add to that since you're here? No, I just appreciate everyone's support and I'm looking forward to doing it again next year. Ryan really put a lot of time and effort into this. And again, I can't, I can't thank her enough for her, her creativity in making this happen. So um, that's my report for tonight. Any questions? So at this point, we're asking for the board to approve the updates in the health and safety plan for both the athletic and the school health and safety plan. We have a motion for that. Do we have to do them separately is a question. Yeah, we'll, 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 we'll um, they're listed <laughs> separately. We can do them real quick separately. It's all right. Okay. Do we have a motion to approve the health and safety plan as presented? Duane, Stacey Barno, I'll make a motion to approve the updated health and safety plan as presented. Okay. Do I have a second? I'll yep. second. Colleen, thank you very much. Um, all in favor? Give me a nod. Okay, unanimous. All right, same thing. Spring athletic health and safety plan update. Do we have a motion to approve the athletic health and safety plan? As I motion to approve the health and safety plan. I mean, the uh, athletic plan. Excellent. Do we have a second? PG, I can toy out a second. Thank you. All in favor, give me a nod. Beautiful. Unanimous. And then, uh, Dwayne, the there's only other the resolution for yep. the um, community service hours that we talked about at the work session. Yep. I was going to bring that up. Okay. So this was the resolution to uh, give a waiver for the community service for the graduating class of 2021. So uh, do we have a motion to approve that waiver uh, of the school's Robert community Renier service? Rob Renier will motion. Do I have a second? I'll second. All in favor? Perfect, thank you very much. Before you move on, can I just reiterate that that is only for the class of 2021, 2021. and this school year and that our current 11th graders still have that requirement in place for their graduation next year. I say that only because we do this every year where we have to hunt down kids for graduation hours or, gradu or for community service hours. So that's Mr. Oh. Bruto telling anybody that's listening, parents, make your kids do your community service hours. Yes. Don't make us tell you that you can't go to graduation because you didn't do your community service hours. We don't want to do that. Right. Perfect. Thank you very much, Brian. Good point. All right. Uh, moving along. Fun time of the evening. Treasurer's report, Mr. Rainier. Thank you for the vote of confidence. Um, but anyway, <laughs> um, so it, it won't be too long tonight. So um, AGS financial, AGCS financial statements approval based on the review of financial statements as presented, administration has recommended 2021 January financials be prevented to the board of trustees. The AGCS administration has requested the board to Approve the financial statements as presented subject to audit review. 2021 fund, uh, February funds activity and vendor uh, transaction reports. You can review them. There's a lot of them. I've sent a lot of checks, so uh, you can review them and they will be uh, approved under the consent agenda. Cash position, school's cash, cash position is very good. Um, this is, uh, this is gonna require a motion, so please, uh, if you didn't have a chance to review, the Department of uh, Environmental Protection contacted the school to determine whether or not the air quality monitoring unit could be situated at the State Route campus to collect air quality data uh, for a 12 month period. The school was open to this request and a meeting was scheduled and reviewed protocols. The DEP unit specifications, the, they de to determine the best and most secure site location, as well as to discuss the documented agreement required at requested move forward. An agreement was drafted and remitted to the legal review. The only revision was to request that the specific to the monthly fee paid AGCS for electrical costs, an increase $150 to $200 so the monthly rental amount was advised as needed to cover increasing en energy costs anticipated over the next year. The revision was accepted and the agreement has been finalized. Based on the completed reviews, administration is requesting the board consider approval of the agreement as presented. 
So can I get a motion to approve the Department of Environmental Protection and Evan Grove Charter School Air Monitoring Equipment License Agreement as presented? Yep, I'll make a motion. Is there a second? I'll second Rob Stacy Barno. All right, any questions? All right, all those in favor raise your hand. Yep, you got it. You got it, Rob. All right, all right. So as mentioned earlier uh, with Brian's uh, the facilities update, AGCS 2021 Summer Capital Improvement Projects bid, a uh, public bid uh, opening and in award contracts. So I'm gonna summarize this because there's a lot of details. As Brian already uh, told us, the general trades contract BSS contractors was 216,000. Plumbing contract, Stan Roche Plumbing for 63,000. Electrical contract, which Brian already noted, we didn't get any bids, which is unusual. And then mechanical contract, clipper pipe and services of 20,700. Contract total is 497,736, not including the pumping contract. Um, is that supposed to be uh, not including the electrical versus the plumbing? That's just a- What was that? Of, it says that's the contract total, not including the plumbing. Do you mean not including the electrical? Electrical, you're right, my bad. All right. Just ask me. So, yeah. Um, so that can be updated. Um, so uh, these have been reviewed by Heckerdorn Schaus Architects. And based on the below, uh, the, the review, the board and finance committee are recommending that we approve these bids. Um, and Brian, please correct me if I'm wrong in any of this stuff, but uh, the motion is to award the publicly, uh, publicly bid AGCS State Road 2021 summer project contracts as follows. And it has the three resolutions below. All right, can I get a bid to approve it? A motion, motion. okay. I'll second Kristen Smith. All right, are there any questions? All right, all those in favor? All right, motion carried. The AGCS 2021-2022 fiscal year budget process. The collection of data and comp compilation is ongoing. Administration is working with the business office to provide information as needed. Um, key dates will be determined when administration will meet and review budget line items. Um, we expect this, uh, we expect Donna to give us more information in the next uh, month meeting. 2019-2020 uh, AGCS employee benefit plan audit. Uh, the, the AGCS engaged Mali LLP to perform the 2019-2020 AGCS benefit plan year audit. The audit field was uh, Field work was completed in January and no findings. Um, the audit was presented to the Finance Committee and all questions and comments were addressed. Administration requests the board to approve the 2019 2020 AGCS employee benefit plan audit as presented, uh, prepared and presented by Mally LLC on the consent agenda. Um, this is a formality, but we have to do it under the consent agenda. Um, AGCS 2019-2020 plan year IRS form 550 approved to file uh, electronically. Administration has completed the review of 2019-2020 plan year IRS 5500 uh, filing for the period covering September 1st, 2019 through August 31st, 2021. I think that should be 2020. 2020. <laughs> with, the, uh, with the board treasurer. There is no payment to administration's recommended the board to approve the document document for electronic filing as presented under the consent agenda. So Sage Intact and Paramount Software implementations. Donna and her team have been doing a lot of work with these guys, get a lot of training, a lot of understanding how we're going to map our existing uh, accounts to the new account system. So a lot of work has been done. Um, there, um, so the main point here is the go live date has been changed uh, to July 1st, 2021, which is why we'll close out the accounting period with our current year budget 
and they're moving, you know, but they, it was originally supposed to go May 1st. So why we're going to switch accounting programs within a year, just easier to do it afterwards. Um, and uh, that, that is the, you can read it. If you have any questions, let me know afterwards. That's the main change in this section. Um, and then at the very end is miscellaneous uh, business office items, 2022-2021 statement of financial interest to due by May 1st, 2021. So uh, if you haven't went online and filed or if you haven't filled out the paperwork to send it to the office, please do so because it's due May 1st. Any questions from anybody? Any questions on All that right. financial interest that you have to do? Everyone get that, yes. especially for the new board members. Is that you want that online? I thought last last month we were unsure whether we were waiting for the paper forms or if we're just doing it online. You want us to do it online? You can. Yeah, Susan, Susan sent out a link. Yep. That's, yeah, I got the link. I just just checked right. before I did it. Uh, normally we fill them out with the paper copy and we keep a copy on file. And for whatever reason, this year, the statements are late. We went online. It seemed really easy. We get a copy okay. for the file. So you can do it either or. Um, we've had some board members and it seems pretty seamless. So that's, that's fine. I just didn't want to do it the wrong way. <laughs> no, no worries. Any other questions? All right. Uh, can I get you... a motion? Oh, there you go. Never mind. <laughs> um, can I get a motion to approve the business office consent agenda as presented this evening? I'll make a motion to approve the business consent agenda. Thank you, Dwayne. Rob, I'll motion. I'll second that motion. Stacy Barno. All right. Is there any questions? All right. Motion carried. All in Thank favor. you, guys. All oh, favor, sorry. Yeah, it's okay. No, it's all right. Gotcha. All good. All in favor. Good. All right. Moving along. Where is she? I'm right here. There she is. All right, Tasha. It's all you. All right. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. So the personnel consent agenda is as follows. Um, we had one resignation, um, Molly Johnson, who's a part-time instructional aide at State Road, and that was effective March 12th. Um, for those of you that know Molly, she will remain on campus She's actually just transitioning to a contractor GHR um, so that we can utilize her skills for or with more hours. So as a part-time employee with AGCS, you typically work 28 hours a week. And with GHR, we're able to um, expand upon those hours without making her full time. Um, retirements, we do not have any. We do not have any releases or leaves. However, I, I am also excited to share that we have one um, addition to payroll under professional staff, Matthew Masick. He has been extended and accepted in our upper school principal offer, and he is going to begin um, effective May 24th. As you all re probably remember in January, I shared that um, Dr. Maitland um, is re resigning as of June. We don't have any support staff to report or contracted vendors. However, I do have one seasonal staff and that is Eliza Malori. She is being hired as an ESY teacher effective June 23rd. The one thing also with Eliza, um, she will start in August as a special education teacher, and I will report out um, closer to August or um, July, but wanted just to make note that you will see her name again. And so administration is recommending the approval of the staffing changes provided within the personnel consent agenda, specifically items listed from 8A through 8I. Great, thank you, Tasha. So I have a motion uh, to approve the personnel consent agenda specifically, this is specifically 8A through 8I. No one jump at once. I know, right? <laughs> I'll make the motion, Michelle McCray. Thank you, Michelle. Do I have a second, please? I'll second Stacy Barno. Thank you, Stacy. All in favor, raise your hand. And unanimous. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tasha. Thank you. We can't, 
wait to meet uh, Matthew. That's exciting. Agreed. Okay, moving along, Donna, policies. Policies. Okay, um, I will make this quick as we review the, these in a little bit more detail at the working session. Uh, the business office is presenting to the board several policies for their 30-day rev review and consideration to approve at the April public board meeting. The policies that have been remitted to the board and they are available on board docs are the pupil allotment tuition income policy, payment of bills policy, the finances policy, student activity fund policy, taxable fringe benefits, fiscal management fund balance with an attachment, the annual resolution to commit funds, and lastly, the gifts and donations. Upon approval of these invoices, there will be two older AGCS policies that'll be rescinded. Uh, the first one is payment of claims policies, which will be replaced by the board docs payment of bills. And then the second is the older AGCS common trust policies, which will be superseded by the board docs gift and donation, donations policy 5002. So again, they are shorter policies. Um, we're looking for the board to review, provide any questions to the business office, and then we'll move into April seeking an approval. Thank you, Dwayne. Thank you, Donna. All right, last thing on our agenda is the, um... A legislative report. Kristen, did you want to talk or did you just want me to give um, the board a quick update on some of the key issues with the governor's proposed charter That's school reform? That's fine, Donna, go ahead. Okay. Um, so I just wanted to make the, the board aware. Um, we've been in some meetings. Um, we've been invited to a legislative breakfast, Kristen and I, next Monday to discuss some of the items that are contained in the charter school reform bill. Um, we've had an opportunity to sit down and review this with the finance committee and um, some of the topics, um, there's multiple ones, um, they're going to present significant challenges um, to, to the school and they will have a direct impact to AGCS. Um, to loosely cover the discussions that have occurred over the last um, couple of weeks and the focus that appears to be the aim for this legislation, um, I just wanted to review some of the challenges. So um, reading through the 124 page bill, um, we had the opportunity to work with Stacy to kind of go through, provide our comments and, um, you know, she took those comments and then is having conversations with legislators herself. Um, but I wanted to bring these to your attention and some of these items are severe funding cuts. Um, they're gonna be our lengthy Unipay process that's already in place. They're going to be adding an additional additional time to that, which looks like another 30 day wait for that unit pay payment um, because they've added a documented refusal of payment requirement for each district before we can even build unit pay. There's a significant administrative roles and duties that have been added um, and the accountability expectation on the charter schools uh, doesn't even come to the level of anything that they're expecting from the, the school districts. Um, there are standards that have been set for a school, a charter school authorizer to reference when they are looking at renewing charter school applications uh, for charter renewal. And if this, the authorizer has the ability to non-renew if one of the standards are not met. Uh, the appeals process to go to the PDE um, could take up to 180 days. So again, this uh, the timeline for the payments, for the renewal, the appeal process are completely unfair and unrealistic and half the school year will be over before the case is even taken up. Um, the most terrifying thing um, is the special education funding. There has been a um, analysis completed that was reviewed with the finance committee this past week. And in talking with Rob, we'd like to set aside a, a special board meeting so that we can review it. One, we kind of want to see where this is going. Does this have any teeth? Um, if it appears that it does have some teeth and they are getting bipartisan support, we really need to sit down so that we can see what this impact for the reduction in special education funding. It's millions to just our charter school alone. Um, and then lastly, um, one of the most concerning um, provisions in this law is that 
it will create a commission and a new accountability matrix for all charter schools. An independent consultant will be hired to assess charter schools operating in Pennsylvania. And the consultant's ability or responsibility is to recommend whether or not Pennsylvania charter school programs should continue, expand, be modified, or terminated. The recommendation would be required, would be required at the five-year mark should this legislation pass. So there are a lot of um, smaller, smaller parts to this or provisions. We're working through that. Kristen and I have been very active. Kristen has been working with John Lawrence. We've worked with Stacy. We will be at the legislative breakfast in Harrisburg next Monday. Um, we have reached out to PASBO, um, our conduit, Bill Wood, who we worked with last year in providing some information, just kind of reiterating the information that we're hearing, which is different than the information that he's hearing, and just putting it out there that there is a lot of work to, to be done. And AGCS um, welcomes the opportunity to be part of the dialogue and to be part of the solution. So more to come. Um, and then as we go to the legislative breakfast, once we get an idea of what is going on with this legislation, if they're really gonna try and push it forward, um, Dwayne, we just like uh, Rob was going to request a time where we can sit down and kind of review what this four tier funding model would, would look like and what that financial impact would be to HECS. So we'll keep you posted. We're hopeful that all of the information that we've been sending out and communicating is gonna resonate with some of these lawmakers and that no action or maybe just accountability action um, for brick and mortars would be the path they take this year. I do believe that given the, um, the narrative in Harrisburg, there will be some changes to cybers. I'm not exactly sure what that is. Kristen and I may have a better opportunity to um, kind of hear that on Monday when we're at the legislative breakfast. So we'll keep you posted. Um, you know, it's just, it's not unusual for them to put out the worst case scenario, uh, but I've never seen a bill like this before. I just want to remind people that this is all proposed language. Obviously, mm -hmm. this is not something that has been put in place on. I, th I think it's just important for me to reiterate, especially with public on the, on the, Absolutely. Call, that they understand that this is a proposal. Correct. And there is an outline of the summary on board docs and it is proposed. So it is large and it is proposed legislation, but it's also important for our community to understand what these provisions are and what they mean, because if they don't go online and look at some of this legislation, it, it could move through and no one is aware of it. So bringing awareness to some of the proposals is critically important to keeping our community um, in the light as to what's going on in Harrisburg. Agreed. Thanks, Donna. Thank you. Rob, you were, you were going to say something that looked like you want to add something? Yeah, no, Dwayne, I just, the next board meeting, this has to be front, like the next uh, session we can have offline or wherever it needs to be. We need to, it, it's, what I've seen is just, it's disturbing. So I just want the parents to know that what the legislation is proposing is disturbing how we will be treated as a charter school versus the regular school. So I just want you guys, it's, it's very important. We all need to engage in this as soon as possible with the parents and engage our legislators. It's, it's disturbing. That's all I can say. All right. Well, whenever you want, Rob, you, you, uh, um, let's talk about it and we'll set it up. It sounds good. Right. Sounds good. Thank you guys. Yep. Um, let's see. Is there anything else from Ms. Bishop or Mr. Bruto? I don't have anything. Okay. I don't either. Thank you, everybody. Perfect. So the, the last thing I want to say, and I hope the, the board, I'm sure, will agree and feel the same sentiment. Um, I'm just very proud of the work you guys have done and the planning just in around the whole going back to school, um, the stuff that you've put in place, the, the, the timelines, the effort. And I mean everybody, including the teachers, the staff. Uh, Brian will, will include facilities because they're working their butts off, but uh, everyone. And, and I'm just so proud. And I'm so excited that the schools in that turnout that they want to come back. I think that's, that's amazing. So um, congratulations and good job. It's a job well done. Um, if there's nothing else, Rob, would you like to make a motion to adjourn the meeting? 
I'd like to make a motion to adjourn the meeting for the evening. Thank you. Is there a second to adjourn tonight? I'll second. All right, Kristen, all in favor? Thank you, everyone, for being here. Everyone have a great night, and we'll talk to you on the next one. What did they ask you if you want to do? Because.